Hi, welcome to Rocky Mountain Views. I'm your host, Martha Thompson. And today we have the honor of spending some time with Barry James Hickey, who is a local author. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Martha. Well, and writing yeah. great books, too. <laughs> I, I enjoy writing. If they're great, that's up to the reader. But uh, yeah. Okay, I, well, yeah. this reader thinks they rock. So <laughs> I recommend it highly. Um, what I find so interesting is that you've not been doing this for years and years. Tell me about when you first decided to write and how long ago that was. Well, I, I started writing at an early age, actually. Uh, I think the first thing I wrote was a poem when I was an elevator operator in Chicago. I was 20, and I remember the first line was, uh, cold thoughts spring from the winter fountain. And I realized I wasn't quite ready to be a writer, so I <laughs> went on to other things and uh, you know, became a, a singer and an actor and did that for decades. And, and I started actually writing screenplays in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I think the first script I wrote, I was 32, and I wrote um, uh, a screenplay called Joe Morgan's Mermaids, uh -huh. set down in Pueblo Reservoir here in Colorado, about a gas station owner who discovers a mermaid while he's fishing, uh, and it ch she changes his life. But uh, Splash came out about six months later, and that took care of the mermaid <laughs> idea. So, but I, I wrote 20 yeah, screenplays would, over the next it. few years, 20 of them, you know, wow. diff all, all different genres. and. Uh, and then I ended up working at Disney and uh, getting to read a lot of screenplays for executives and, and I also worked in the story department there so I probably read 10 screenplays sometimes a day especially on weekends other people's work mm -hmm. and what I started to learn from that was uh, plotting characters structure but it wasn't quite novel writing per se uh, my first book really came about from a screenplay. I, uh, I came back here to Colorado and I ended up teaching uh, English at a, a charter school for a couple of years. And I wrote this screenplay based loosely on my adventures with this group of uh, young teenagers in, in, in an after school program. So from the screenplay though, I realized here I go again, the Hollywood thing, you gotta mail it out, you've gotta get the agent. I'd written so many scripts that never got made and, and that's mm -hmm. hard to, to spend six months, three months sometimes, working on a story, character development, uh, the histrionics, the integrity of it, the location. And, and I realized what was missing for me in screenplays, and, and, and that was all the rest that goes with reading. A movie's different. You, right. you write a screenplay, it's handed off to actors, a director, producers, set decorators, and everything is different from what you might have imagined as a writer. Whereas writing a book is all my fault. It's, uh, <laughs> you, you know, right? I, beginning and middle and end. Uh, somebody may give me a suggestion to maybe change something here and there, but for the most part, the, the magic of writing is this closed, uh, closed book end story. From beginning to end, you take somebody on an adventure and they get to uh, be totally engaged by it. And when they get to that last page, if they let out a sigh and say, whew, boy, that sure beat going to the movies or, or something like right. that. Then I, kn I know I did my job, but I love to entertain people, and I find I can entertain people better than as an actor or as a screenwriter with, with a, a well-planned uh, story that excites the imagination and, and makes you think about, about things in your life, help you maybe uh, reflect on what the story brings mm. to your personal life. So a, a lot of that often is some of the magic that a reader can walk away saying, wow, I, I never knew that. Well, and it's the reason that I love to read so much is that there's a, there's a depth that um, I, I don't think a movie can touch. There's a depth that, you know, a, no screenplay, even if you put it in there, it's not going to be translated into television or film mm -hmm. there's a there's a way that you can um, just really get into a character in in ways that become very very real and so that's why the books will always be so precious to me here's the other magic thing about other writers that I try to incorporate in mine is is uh, you have to be all your characters you have to understand them Right. And so I'm this 12-year-old girl, I'm this 45-year-old man, I'm a grandfather, 
I'm a lonely widow. I'm a Hispanic girl working at a hotel. You know, all the characters that I've developed over my first four books. And uh, fortunately, though, uh, y you can't just pull it out of nowhere. So, so my life experiences sure. in many ways have taught me to observe people a lot and pay attention to everybody around me. So as an actor, I can maybe perform something outside myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a writer, understand that age, you know, that uh, demographic of where that person might come from, the history and psychology of a character. Maybe it makes it into the book or not, but it's good to know your characters so well. And, uh, and that's the fun of it, too, because uh, characters have a way of uh, becoming real to you. It's Very an real. Thing. Yeah. And there's yeah. a difference. I'd like to hear about um, some of the things that you have done thus far in life because um, your life has been anything but boring. You have done so many interesting things, but um, what you just said really made me think of it because there's, a, there's certainly the, um, the ability to do research on characters. Mm -hmm. um, yours is based so much on your own real life experience that you can't research that. You know, you have lived things mm -hmm. that you write about, and that's there. You know, it's there's. I think readers are savvy enough to know when uh, the person that uh, they're reading hasn't just looked it up. You know, right. It's so. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the things because you, you're a singer. You've you know done your your screenwriting, um, time spent in L.A. Tell me about. Tell me about you. Well, I, I guess, uh, boy, here I go, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Sadly, there's just water in there. There's nothing to calm <sighs> you down or make it easier. But <laughs> we got a really big show tonight, folks. Well, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Okay. And I had uh, eight brothers and sisters. Um, I was a middle child. I uh -huh. uh, went to a public school for a year, and then I went to a uh, Catholic school. My father was a tree surgeon in the inner city on the south side. And uh, already the characters started coming around me from real life. Uh, uh, every summer, um, guys would come up with their families from Appalachia and live in the motels in the neighborhoods and work for my father during the summer. And uh, so already I was exposed to these other cultures. I mean, we had the, we had the African-American, the Irish, the Italian, the Polish all around me. But to find these exotic people from Appalachia thrown into the mix of that, and there was a guy named Gypsy John from... Uh, <laughs> somewhere and uh, just you know odd characters all around me uh, I remember the German baker as a little boy my brother Kevin and I would go and scrape the uh, it's not sugar it's glucose off the floor of the bakery from okay. him cooking all night and then he'd give you a bag of donuts for a quarter that's right folks a quarter <laughs> and uh, th that was pretty cool so as a young kid I was exposed to work I, I had a paper route um, I had a, uh, the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun Times the Tribune weighed about 10 pounds on Sunday, and I had a cart. It was six feet long by about three feet wide and three feet deep, and giant metal wheels for the Sunday paper. And I weighed about 98 pounds, and I was five feet four then. I've really <laughs> shot up. <laughs> and fortunately, there's a small hill because it weighed about a ton, and I had to push that giant cart to get to my route and Goodness. slowly unload papers so I could push the cart back up the hill to the agency. So I did that from about the age of uh, 10 years old till I was about 13. Besides being a paper boy, you got paid every uh, uh, two weeks, um, your commission, if you will, and how many customers you had. And the men at the paper agency would try to take money from the children by playing poker with us. So at an early age, I was exposed to these cigar smoking guys drinking beer at 10 in the morning. These All these subcultures existed around me at an early age, besides the mix of uh, uh, becoming an altar boy, uh, singing in the choir, other things, becoming a Boy Scout uh, for a couple of years, and then having what's, I guess you would call it a gang. My friends may disagree. <laughs> I don't know. But we thought we were gangsters because we wore black shirts, black pants, and Stacey Adams shoes and uh, things like that. It makes me think of Cheech and Chong, you know. Yeah. It's not a gang, it's a club. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Yeah, and, 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 but it really was, it, it was a childhood friends from elementary school and, and where my culture was, everybody had to go to these certain different schools because mm -hmm. that was family tradition. So 
I went right. on to public school with my brothers. Uh, kids went to, you know, St. Leo, Carmel, St. Rita, Brother Rice, yeah, and, you know, off to, off to the Catholic schools, and I went on to public school. And uh, during that time, I got a job about 15 years old working in gas stations called uh, Gas USA. And it was a chain of them owned by a good old Irish name, being Chicago Southside Irish, mm -hmm. named Danny Boy. But Danny Boy was from Greece, and all the guys that ran his stores were <laughs> Greek immigrants. And so that was interesting. And uh, as I evolved from that, I worked uh, uh, nights uh, in gas stations. After that, I decided I wanted to go to college, but I didn't have the money, didn't have the resources. Right. Uh, so I ended up uh, working at U.S. Steel as a millwright apprentice. Uh, and they put me in an academic program. I guess I had high math skills. And I did that for about nine months. And I ended up quitting my job over a dog. Um, a, a German Shepherd got hit running across the street on my way to work at 6 a.m. And I ended up taking it to a, a vet. And I was late to work. And so the foreman told me to go home and think about my job. And I said, I already thought. And two days later, I was driving to Canada to go canoeing uh, with a couple of my brothers. After that, I did other things. I was. Uh, worked uh, as a night clerk at a millionaire's club in Chicago called the uh, Union League Club. And it was, um, once again, another part of society that I was never exposed to. The chairman of the board of, uh, of uh, the Union Pacific Railroad was a member, uh, another famous person. This is back in the early 70s. Uh, w. Clement Stone, who at the time was one of the richest men in America. Hmm. And he was a member and very eccentric and s interesting stories from them. And my favorite guest who ever stayed there was Tex Beneke. Tex Beneke, I think he played with um, Benny Goodman. And he wrote wow. uh, Elmer's tune. I don't know if you remember that one. He, he was a big guy with a big, he looked like a hound dog. And he played this big old saxophone. And uh, he had to do a show for uh, New Year's coming up. So he asked if he could play in the lobby at 2 a.m. And I said, sure. And, we sat around talking all night, and, and Tex Beneke played me Elmer's tune. And, this is uh, Elmer's tune. I don't want to sing it all, but it's <laughs> a good song. And uh, anyway, that was kind of cool. And then uh, in the middle of these things, I would do other things. I hitchhiked uh, from Chicago to uh, New Orleans for Mardi Gras one year with uh, my friend Scott. And uh, that was interesting, getting picked up by all these uh, uh, crazy people. A lot of people think hitchhikers are the scary ones. The <laughs> actually, sometimes it's the drivers. The people that pull yeah, over. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, guys trying to stick needles in our arm, putting a gun <laughs> to my head. Um, a guy who just got out of prison and his wife decided to do a belly dance for him on the side of the road at one of those uh, pull-offs at a picnic table. and Okie dokie. And we were the audience. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just but things like that. And I got to meet Jackie Gleason from that. I got to Mardi Gras wow. and I snuck into the... Uh, the convention center to get his autograph and he made me sit there and drink whiskey with him and his wife and you know so you know the magic of travel and being you know mixed cultures uh, outside of from what I might have been stuck in I suppose if you want to call it yeah stuck. so it gives you yeah. you know such a a, um, a rich collection of people to to write about to uh, you know from. and to yeah yeah, yeah. so um, how many books have you written to to date? Because I know this, this one's is coming number four. Out. This is number four, and this will come out in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, the official okay. launch is uh, July twenty seventh, two thousand thirteen, uh, and uh, I'm going to do a uh, release party for that here in Colorado Springs. You're all welcome to come. It'll be Super. at the uh, Dutch Mill Tavern. People say, "Wait, you do a book release at a tavern?" I like to mix it up because I'm also a singer and a performer. And I realized too that once again, just as I've met this string of different individuals in life, that's what my friends are. They're all different from each other, and my readers. So I like to mix them all together, and and you know get them to know each other. And saying it's not about Barry the writer. It's uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier. It's um, I don't get invited to weddings anymore, so I have to. I have to create my own at, at my age, right? It's so only funerals. So you throw your own parties, no problem. Yeah, right. And, and it's well, really, it's and it's really to share back to the to the people that support me in, in trying to be a writer. And, and nice. half the people that show up at my events won't read my books, but they like uh, the ambiance of the fact that I might read someday. And if I ever do read, it might be your book. That's okay. Right. You know, right. as long as they're at least being attracted to something literary. Sure, yeah. it's a start. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's an absolute start. Mm -hmm. And we'll make sure um, 
the folks will make sure that um, at the end of the program today I'm going to get all the information from Barry about his signings and that way you'll have a copy of it you'll be able to see it and um, hopefully you'll come and visit us because uh, do you know what I will be there good and so that way I could um, have a chance to meet some of our viewers as well which I would a great I would opportunity love very I never much. thought of that yeah very yeah. very much yeah now no, um, no I do have one book to add after this um, I'm almost done I've got a week left on it with all the wildfires in Colorado here uh, yes, I, uh, I have a a, a good friend named Kevin Donovan. He's a local attorney, and uh, we put together a book called *The Water Lawyer*. So it's very topical for what's going on in Colorado about water rights, and it's a it's a murder mystery along the lines of a John Grisham type novel. So that okay. that's going to bump up after this. So I try to do two books a year. I think I can do it. Well, good. Well, yeah. we'll make sure that we post that as it is getting ready to come out it as well. So we'll make sure that people know um, how to get it. And um, again, for signings for this, we'll be a part of that. Excellent. Um, okay. Now, um, it, a lot of you may not know, I meet with our guests uh, prior to the day of filming because um, I want to make sure that I tell their story um, because the show is all about our guests. And uh, one of the things that Barry and I talked about was getting young people interested in reading. Mm -hmm. So if you would talk to me uh, about what you shared the other day that kids get from learning to write mm -hmm. and becoming, hopefully becoming a published author, but regardless, let's talk about yeah. what they get from doing that. Well, uh, a few things. Uh, going back to my youth again, I was embarrassed to share my writing coming from a big family, ridicule. Uh, I remember carrying a giant bag of books when I was in college and uh, my friends, no, I, pretty much I was the only one who went to college back then, give or take a few here and there, but um, okay. it, it was an odd, odd thing growing up that reading wasn't really all that accepted in my culture. And for me, it was oh. my saving grace. Well, I, I got kicked out of, not really kicked out, but uh, ex uh, escorted to the door at this public school. One of my brothers got shot in a, a little uh, kid gang fight when he was 16, I was 15. So I had to leave public school to protect me and my brothers. And I ended up going to an all boys Catholic school out in the suburbs. And uh, I didn't have any friends there. So every lunch period I spent in the library. And uh, that was great for me because all of a sudden for the first time I had access to, to things. And I read constantly, and then I worked in a gas station, and you only had to get up when the bell rang when people pulled in. So I read voraciously. And as a young man, I thought I was going to go blind. I had conjunct conglomeratory conjunctivitis, where you wake up and you can barely see out of your eyes. Good and heavens. Doing the eye drops and everything. So the doctors recommended after school, it was around 10 years old till I was about 12, that don't push the envelope. So I would stay in my room and read books while I could hear the kids outside playing. Fortunately, at my disposal was Jack London, Mark <laughs> Twain, you know, great writers. So that really opened up the world to me again from my, you know, what you see in your daily experience. And that's the magic that so many young people today can have for themselves. And that is, this book can be yours and only yours. You can read these characters and the blonde haired girl can be shaped however you see her. And, and the other character, whatever it is, um, it's so great to use your imagination in life. And uh, so you got to start an, at a young age, though, because these are, these are tools that need to be uh, sharpened. So read a lot when you're younger. The other value that comes from reading, it makes you a better writer. I'm not saying you're going to use big words, but you learn how to spell. Mm -hmm. When I got into high school teaching here for a few years at this charter school, I was uh, quite surprised at the level of reading of kids today. Now, Yes. We, we have our iPods, we have all these distractions, television and this and that, a and uh, it, it's really impacted today's youth. And don't get me wrong, I meet some kids who are brilliant with words, but the majority now are really falling out of the written word, and uh, there's so much there to be taken. The other advantage of reading when you're a young person is you find out more about your own self-identity that you may not get when you're uh, stuck in, in culture where you're constantly being challenged to find your position in, in um, you That's know, in interacting. Point. Yeah. So 
by reading you get to be in your own world and you're you're almost walking around with ammunition in your pocket for saying I know I'm living this life with my family at the dinner table right. but nobody knows that I'm reading uh, War and Peace <laughs> you know that I'm actually in Russia right now while somebody's saying pass the potatoes and so your your creativity starts to get fired up constantly and as you get older you find more resources to pull it from but it's also a great way for people in their lives young people to understand uh, the disconnect of how things work in their family system, in mm -hmm. their school system, in their work relationships, wh whatever they may be, that you can find a center at an early age and, 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 and discover that creativity. It may not lead to writing, it might lead to painting, it might lead to music or something else, uh, working with your hands, being a, a carpenter. All of it's good as long as you, you explore your creativity. Yeah. You have to explore it and you have to give yourself the opportunity to explore it because nobody's going to give it to you. True. Yeah. True story. Well, and you know, a lot there are, especially with the nightmare that um, that are student loans. Not everyone is going to be able to go to college, mm -hmm. and I'm a big believer in higher education, even if you never utilize that that specific degree. Um, my degree is in psychology. I, you know, it, have not used it in in the classic sense. Um, but my world got bigger because of college. And for those who can't do that, who is, that's not an option, their world can get really big through books. There are things that can be experienced that otherwise you'd have no access to you know so it's the universe is at your disposal through books through reading Th there's also some magic to being a writer um, I know in today's culture uh, it's all visual I want to be a rapper I want to be a basketball star I want to be uh, right. Tom Cruise or whatever a, a writer can look like anything and live anywhere I remember uh, Emily Dickinson the poet uh, she was pretty much a recluse I, I don't think yes. her poetry came out until after her death you know, what a great treasure trove. So, so, uh, so the world, the internal world of the writer can always be there for you. And whether you publish or not is another thing. You could just write memoirs and it never is seen by anyone, which is fine. It's a great way to express your, your thoughts, your predicament, your understanding of yourself or how to deal with challenges. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I met a, a young lady, she was 12, 12 years old uh, the other day and uh, she knew all about publishing. She knows about <laughs> create space. Uh, th there's a, a company called CreateSpace where Amazon.com, the huge digital publishing world today, yes. is really promoted by companies like Amazon and a few other sites. And how it works in digital publishing now is uh, a company like CreateSpace, you upload your book as a PDF file, three days later they review it, hit the button, and uh, you're on Amazon as a published author with a book cover or anything else, they walk you through the steps. And, and there are hey, about eight incredible. companies. Yeah, you're, you're published in two weeks nowadays, oh whereas my, my process of uh, being a singer, mm -hmm. waiting for the agent, making the CD, saving the money to mail it to somebody, writing the letter, yes. you know, waiting six months, never re hearing back from someone. And in my screenwriting days, uh, my walls were papered with rejection letters, mm -hmm. um, which is okay. I don't mind rejection. It's the fact that you do it that counts. I'll take rejection any day, knowing I put myself out there to yeah, be rejected. Tried. Yeah, yeah. And what am I? What am I being rejected by? Someone I never met, uh, who you know, maybe never even read my work, which is often the case. Now, if I were, uh, you know, uh, Stephen King, they'd all be looking at my work, right? But those are far and few between, so you have to realize the, the payoff for a writer isn't about how much money am I going to make. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that you told a good story, made a point or two about something in there. The reader came away better off for having read your story, yes. and maybe they'll read the next one and the other one and the other one, or maybe they'll pick up the pen and go, I can write a better story, and I had this idea, oh my gosh, this woman in the story triggered me to write a, my own story. So. It's amazing how many writers are on the world who, who've never written. That makes sense. But I, I'm um, really drawn to what you had to say about writing, even if it's just for you. Mm -hmm. And 
the ability to get to know yourself. You know, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Plato is, the unexamined life is not worth living. And, you know, we, we hear, gosh, talk shows all the time, you know, I don't know what my calling is, I don't know why I'm, I'm here, you know, what is my purpose? Well, it doesn't come in a flash, uh, you know, of lightning. It comes through some soul searching mm -hmm. and it does come through doing things like writing and getting to know who you are and what lights you up and where your gifts lie. So I think that's fantastic. That's, that's so smart, Barry. Well, <laughs> realize sometimes you trip into your new adventures in life, which is pretty cool. I mean, you can trip into learning you're a writer and never having explored it, or being a singer, or sure. whatever that outlet is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. I remember the first time, uh, uh, I'll go back to my singing, right? This kind of correlates with the writing thing, where I didn't know what the heck, I, I knew I had an ability, a gift, but I had no way to explore it or put it out there. Uh, and then I, I, I remember telling you the story, my sister had this little yellow phonograph player right. with the pop-up lid and the speaker in the lid. And uh, Love is Blue by some orchestra. I bought this for 25 cents. and But I didn't know anything about music then. I was a kid and ended up being uh, El Martino. And there were lyrics to the song. And that, oh my gosh, first time I really paid attention to a singer. And then later in life, uh, Sinatra and Elvis and orchestras and all those things that, wow, this is pretty incredible. Then you take that music and you apply it towards books and, and characters and you're creating a, an orchestra of words and, and symphonies. And the world opens up. Yeah, yeah. Well, we want to do something. Barry has uh, made an incredible offer. Um, we're going to have a contest and um, it's just a one-page essay to write. Um, it's eligible for kids up to the age of 22 and we'd like you to submit those to us. Um, Barry is going to take a look at your writings. Mm -hmm. He's going to choose five winners, and you are going to receive a signed copy of his book. Cool. So I wish you the very best of luck. Um, we'll be posting all of the information about your book signings, and um, can't wait for the next one. No, Your books are terrific. Well, thanks. I appreciate that, Martha. I'm, I'm glad uh, to let you into that universe. And it's a singular universe that every book is separate from the next. W with the uh, contest, let's, uh, it just has to be one page. Uh, old teacher here, single spaced. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, and you know, spark, spark our interest. It'll be fun to to see and I'd love to sign a copy and get that back to you, okay? Terrific, mm -hmm. it'll be happening. Good. Again, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for watching today and we'll see you at our next show.